Welcome to the Calder Farmstead. Now the ice hogs back out to center in transition. Carlson with Quinville two on one. Right wing cross across the Quinville scores. Here's a chance for Perry. Five feet scores on the faceoff. Up it's Eminger. Go back to Wierenski. Has it. Shoots one. Bounces off a man. Five seconds left. Wierenski. Another jam on the shot. Turning it. Firing. And now, with nine minutes gone in overtime, the Bears breaking out. Right side with Bear. Looks like coming to the net. Bear with the score! And here are your hosts, CeCe and Sean. Hello and greetings from the mile high city of Denver, Colorado. And St. Albert, Alberta. Oh, Canada. Welcome to the Calder Farmstead Podcast, episode number 40 for Tuesday, June 1st. 2021. If you were hoping for a podcast featuring the effects Western U.S. railroads had on rural farming communities, we are not going to be much help. This is an American Hockey League podcast, and my name is CeCe Hockley. And I'm Sean O'Brien. And as always, we thank you for tuning in with us. And if you're new to hearing CeCe and I talk about hockey, we're going to talk about some AHL news as well as recap the Pacific Division playoffs. We both watch a lot of AHL games. We're going to talk about what we see when we watch the film, as well as use some advanced stats to help us break it down. If that's new to you, you might want to head over to our podcast feed or YouTube channel, wherever listening to us from, and check out episode zero. You got to scroll all the way to the bottom, but it's down there. It's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about, as well as how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're new to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms, like PDO or the point shares model, or newer hockey terms like controlled zone entries, go check that out so you better be able to pick up what we're putting down. I promise it's not that nerdy or technical. It's only 20 minutes. And let's be honest, you wasted 20 minutes wondering how many people were in the arena for Game 7 in Toronto. They're all frontline healthcare workers who were there as first responders in case Toronto choked. You'll never get those 20 minutes wondering about that back. So next time, why not spend a little more time talking hockey with us? But there's uh, there's no such thing as jinxes, right, Sean? Toronto is a jinx. So. <laughs> Just the whole Maple Leafs franchise. I mean... Yeah. If you want to, if you want to see a a funny yet very very tragic video of the history of the Toronto Maple Leafs, go check out Urinating Tree on YouTube and his video about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Just since 1967, just one bungle after another with that franchise. Anyway, let's talk AHL hockey because it's award season. It's the postseason. Henderson and Bakersfield in the Pacific Division final wrapping up. We will get to that here in a bit but first and foremost we had the coach of the year award get doled out the winner of the lewis a.r pieri memorial award as the ahl's outstanding coach for the 2020-21 season feels kind of weird saying that since they only played in 2021 but i digress anyway long and short of it spencer carberry for the Hershey Bears. And boy, if you saw Sean on social media, he mentioned every coach. Well, not every coach, but he mentioned four coaches other than Spencer Carberry. But enough of that. Spencer Carberry. Spencer Carberry. I, I can't really get over that, Sean. I mean, Carberry was fifth on my pretend ballot. Uh, shockingly, we don't get to vote on these awards, which does make some sense. Um, as I imagine the league was ne- will never be giving ballots to people who have been openly critical of them and the teams and the officials and s- lots of things, which we have done repeatedly on the show. So mm-hmm. I don't expect for them to be, you know, e- uh, ginning up to us, asking us for our opinion on awards, which is fine. Uh, that's why we should have, that's why we have our own awards show and you should tune into that. That should be coming up uh, later this week. But I had Carberry fifth for a few simple reasons. Um, number one, two thirds of Hershey's games were against Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, and Bingo, who were, in no uncertain terms, bad. Uh, we knew they'd be bad from the preseason. If you want to go back to listen and listen to those preseason previews we did in late January, we called it then. They were going to be bad, and they were. Uh, and we talked about uh, Hershey's poor power play tactics a bunch. I know the assistant coach typically run these special teams and it seems like this was Scott Allen's unit for my kind of reading of press releases and how it's handled. Regardless, at some point the buck stops at the head coach. It's his job to manage the team as well as manage his assistant coaches. Hershey also made uh, regular questionable lineup choices this season. Axel Janssen Fallaby on the third line and no power play time. Okay. 
Uh, Kale Kessie over Alexi Protas in games. Kale Kessie over Brett Clark once or twice, I believe. Eddie Whitcow is anything but an emergency uh, defenseman. Yep. Okay. Like, <laughs> yes, they won a bunch of games. But when your lineup has that much more talent than two-thirds of your opponents, which the Bears absolutely did. We talked about it last time, how the Bears have like six or seven middle six forwards that they could just plug in and get offense from the entire season, and they did that. Um, but when you have that much more talent than two-thirds of your opponents, you can screw things up like power play strategy, line deployments, et cetera, and still win games. And also, uh, they got really good goaltending which always makes coaches look better when your goalie just makes saves. Like, so I, I still think that he's a worthy candidate. Like he's not undeserving of this award mm -hmm. more that there were four other coaches. I felt were more deserving. And as you alluded to just now and on social media earlier, those other coaches, those other candidates, they had some pretty valid resumes for the 2021 season. And yet they didn't get the nod. Like you said, I mean, Hershey played against two opponents really all season long. And, um, you know, at least two bad opponents, as you said, all season long. Yeah. So let's line it out. Let's, let's hear the the case for the other, for the other candidates that were up for coach of the year. Uh, I mean, first and foremost, the one who I thought was going to walk away with it was Joel Bouchard. Um, he had his team that played a much tougher schedule and he rolled those teams and he didn't do so with, you know, uh, a talent, uh, a, a lineup that just jumped off the page at you. Like if you would have asked me before, like, you know, is, is Yolan in a, a, a top six, four in the AHL? I'd have been like, I mean, maybe he could be same with guys like Jordan wheel, uh, Raphael Harvey Pinard. Like those are not, you know, Oh, that's not a just treasure trove of talent that, you know, everyone in the AHL is like that guy's, you know, super good. You can't, th there are no Matt Molson's or, uh, Garrett Pilons on that team. Um, Whereas like they rolled the Canadian division for the majority of the year um, with superior tactics and team buy-in that team for checked you in a submission. They skated with you the whole time. They played a very aggressive team game. That's a hallmark of good coaching. And they did all of that with very average goaltending through most of the season. Like none of their combination of Caden Primu or Michael McNiven uh, really like just stole games for them. They were for the most part, good enough to win. Like, I was really surprised to see uh, Caden Primo get a nod for the Canadian all-star team um, as the goaltender. I'm not, you know, lighting torches and uh, trying to cross the border for it, but like I, I had Gustafsson there is better, but I, I thought Joel Blachard, you know, really coached up a talented, but not superiorly talented team to just crush the Canadian division for the majority of the year, right up into the point in which like his number or three of his top four scores, I believe it was, went down for the year in like late April. And then they kind of struggled from there. But like when you take the, that number of guys off the team, yeah, bad outcomes are going to happen. You can't just replace three of your top four scores. Um, another candidate who I thought uh, really deserved it, and we'll talk about him uh, later, is Manny Viveros. Uh, finished the regular season in first in the most talented division in the AHL without question. Um, he got tremendous buy-in from that roster. Uh, that Chicago Wolves team that he basically inherited to become the Henderson Silver Knights, um, in 1920, they were 22nd out of 31 teams. So anyone thinking that like, oh, Chicago, they, they, were really, they really weren't that good. No, not that um, year. Not last, uh, two years ago now. Yeah, and he didn't get a lot of favors in, uh, from Vegas in terms of lineup choices and last-minute call-ups. They were pulling guys you know, important key players on that team all the time. And yes, most coaches had to deal with that this season, but to do that with the Chicago's roster, more or less from last year to also lose Peyton Krebs pretty early on to the CHL again, um, to find, you know, a diamond in the rough or to have a diamond in the rough, like Logan Thompson really show what he can do uh, as well as a much more grueling schedule playing six more games in the same time span as Hershey. And oftentimes uh, in a lot more grueling fashion of like, uh, playing just ridiculous numbers of games, whereas Hershey's schedule in terms of density was a pretty normal one. Um, and they also played, you know, much better teams, San Diego, Bakersfield, much better teams than anything Hershey played. I mean, Lehigh Valley's good, but they weren't Bakersfield good. They weren't San Diego good. Um, another good candidate I thought was Jay Leach. Now I 
felt like he was always going to get passed over because it seems like voters more just sort uh, the stats page on the AHL.com. And uh, he does not top any of them except for he comes pretty close in you know, win percentage for Providence. But, I mean, he had that team running smoothly and on point despite probably the most disruptive schedule. It's easy to get guys you know, uh, up for games when you play a game like every day, every other day, to get in the flow of things. But like not playing, you know, playing once a week, maybe four or five days apart in between games, that's a lot more disruptive than I think people would recognize. Um, he also got a lot of call-ups from the Bruins regularly and had to kind of plug and play guys uh, where they could fit in. I mean, he was juggling three, four, five goalies, two of which are pretty ECHL caliber-ish. Um, when Sw- uh, Swayman got called up, Vladar, you know, was up, down, and all around uh, the New England area when Boston needed a goaltender, as well as a bunch of forwards and defensemen. Jack Sean, who I thought was probably their best defenseman all year, spent a good chunk of time, uh, you know, on the press box tour in, Bo- in Boston. And the other thing, too, is they can't hide anything from the two teams they played all season. I mean, this is the Groundhog's Day division. You're playing the same teams over and over. So it's not like you can really... Uh, try some trickery with them because they're going to, they know your game so well. Uh, And Hartford was good this year. Like they started off rough, but they came back strong and they were at least as good as Lehigh Valley. I thought. Um, And even though Bridgeport was bad, Bridgeport was better than bingo or Wilkes-Barre Scranton. And yet, despite all of those kind of weird factors for Jay Leach and the Providence Bruins, Every game, business as usual. Consistent performance from his players. Uh, and like I said, I, I think they played a tougher schedule than what Hershey had, despite only playing Hartford and Bridgeports. Um, I, I thought all three of those were more deserving coaching resumes from this season than Spencer Carberry. But, you know, hey, when I sort uh, points percentage on AHL.com, Hershey shows up first. And, well, how could that be wrong? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's interesting, Sean and I have had this conversation off, you know, off recording, off the record, off the mic. And it, it reminded me of talking on another podcast when I was just cutting my teeth, just beginning to get ushered into my first hosting job about two or three years ago. And I brought up the question about, you know, ECHL, like MVP voting and things like that. And of course I was unofficially voting for for someone that was in the mountain division in the ECHL. And I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know anybody else and I don't feel comfortable voting just on statistics alone. So I'm going to vote on who I know. I'm going to vote on who I've seen in that mountain division. And so with that kind of priming the pump, the the auto go-to for, for AHL voters of, of Spencer Carberry, like you said, Sean, to just click on the points percentage and say, oh, Hershey Bears topped the list. You know, they they were the best team in the AHL by points percentage. Who's their head coach? And so for, you know, that kind of um, phoning it in process in, in regards to, you know, not really doing a ton of research, and I don't want to discount every AHL voter because, you know, I mean, it, it's 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 daunting to cover 28 next year, back to 31 teams. It's daunting to cover that for a season. Sean and I can attest to it, but we we got to talking about it and it raised a lot of questions and I'll yield the floor to Sean. You know, it raised a lot of questions as to how this whole process gets done. And I actually, you know, sent out some DMS uh, to people who did vote on these awards and to people who have voted on them in the past that didn't this year. And it's not shocking how unnuanced these awards are when you look at it, because as we've talked about, there's not a lot of league-wide coverage. That's part of the reason why this podcast exists. We saw that there really wasn't that league-wide coverage uh, from, you know, a a podcasting perspective and that kind of, you know, breaks down games and talks about players individually. Like, nobody else really does that. Uh, And most AHL coverage is exclusively local. I mean... The, the beat writers in Ontario covering the rain uh, probably aren't watching too many just random Syracuse crunch games, not just this season, but any season. Right. Yet these are the writers that are voting on these league-wide awards. They aren't allowed to vote for the team that they cover, which is stupid in my mind. Uh, if you were worried about their opinions being biased by the market they cover, you shouldn't let them be credentialed journalists to begin with. But that's a topic for another time. But this is how we get awards winners that are just best defenseman is defenseman leading the league in points. Uh, Best goaltender is the guy leading in wins unless second place has a much better GAA. 
MVP is the guy leading in points because not only are the media members voting on this, there are apparently players and coaches that vote too. And if you think the coaches are have enough free time on their hands, uh, if they're, you know, on the Grand Rapids Griffins staff, if they're, you know, wandering around checking out like San Jose Barracuda games or uh, Binghamton Devils games, you are incorrect. They are not. Uh, unless it is a team that they are playing or will play, coaches are too busy for that. And players definitely are too busy for that. Like, you're not getting votes from them for players they've seen, unless they're, you know, former players, former teammates, anything like that. They're doing the same thing a lot of these media guys are. They're just, you know, looking at the stack page and being like, well, you know, I remember when we played him like last season, he was really good and he's having a great, you know, he's putting up points this year. So he's MVP, defenseman of the year, rookie of the year, whatever. Like that's not a good method to award these. Like, especially if you're a Pacific division player in most years, or in this case, in the Atlantic division, like Morgan Barron's getting snubbed just because like when you sort by points, he doesn't come up because he played, you know, 15 fewer games. What was he supposed to do? Yeah. And under even the normal circumstances at the next level in the NHL, you have teams, I believe each team plays every other team, a home and away. The in, during, most years, yeah. in most years, in a normal functioning year without a global pandemic, you know, gumming up the works. That's how it works. And so you have, you know, beat writers, you have guys that are familiar with the league and that pay attention to certain players on the league and that have, in my opinion, a more informed vote than someone at the AHL level. Because like you said, not only are Ontario Reign personnel not paying attention to Syracuse Crunch games, I mean, uh, look at San Jose and Colorado. They didn't even play each other this year. So so this year was just super strange across a lot of different levels. And so to to sort by points, points percentage, you know, it's not fair to the, like you said, the Morgan Barons of the world. Because yeah. they could ha they could have a, a standout season in a three-team division and – they're not they're like you said, they're gonna get snubbed based on the fact that, oh, well, so and so played 44 games, so and so played 36, 40 games. So they yeah. accumulated more points. Yeah, it's not it's not fair for sure. It's not a, it's but, not a good process. And the other thing too is when you're an NHL writer, like there are NHL beat writers who, you know, are do great work at the NHL level who got to vote on AHL awards, which I think is bonkers. Like, let's be serious. They might, you know every once in a while show up to an AHL game, write an AHL column, but like, they don't know these players. They don't know. They definitely don't know the players not on the beat they're covering at the AHL from the NHL level. They definitely do not. And uh, I mean, the, the other thing too is that at the NHL level, like there is so much more league wide coverage, even if mm -hmm. you aren't, you know, watching games outside of your market, you can go to other resources and be able to form your own opinion based on, you know, kind of the wisdom of crowds from the glut of league wide coverage, which just doesn't exist here. Like right. the only other person who I could say absolutely from a media perspective, who like his vote, I would absolutely trust to, to do league wide awards. is Patrick Williams, Pat covers the whole absolutely. league. Pat, yes, does. Pat is probably one of the few people I can point to and be like, that guy probably watches more, watch more AHL games this season than you and I did. Like, <laughs> yeah, that I, I really couldn't think of anyone else who I could point to be like, you watched more games than I did this year. I actually like tried to average it out a little bit. I did about 122 this season. Wow. That's, that's a handful. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I've seen every team multiple times. Mm -hmm. So like, I feel good about my opinions of players, but I don't know if you're like a, if you're a beat writer on the West Coast and you covered that team, even incredibly in you know, in depth, can you name five Hartford Wolfpack skaters? I wouldn't blame you if you couldn't. Like, it's, you're supposed yeah, it's not a, you're it's supposed not, to do your due dil diligence on your beat and on your job, and the rest of, like, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> All right, my my um, efforts have now shifted from getting Sean an AHL coaching job to yeah. getting Sean an AHL vote for, <laughs> for that. There we go. He seems a little more agreeable. Uh, you know, that seems a little more agreeable to him. <laughs> but I mean, I, but, I think our award show is going to be more fun. So it will, I mean, I it will. We could do both, but anyway, yeah. let's, there is one award that's coming out on Tuesday that we, yes. uh, I mean, I guess we should preview a little bit, but CC let's uh, set it up there. Yes. So, 
the winner of the 2020-21 Aldridge Baz Bastion Memorial Award for Outstanding Goaltender will be announced Tuesday. And only, I mean, there's a few goalies that come to mind, but really only one should be getting this award. And if he doesn't, yeah, we'll we'll riot. <laughs> but if really. this is not Logan Thompson's award, we riot, plain and simple. Yes. I mm-hmm. will storm Springfield, Massachusetts at the Marriott or wherever their office space is. <laughs> like he finished the season with a 943 save percentage. Here's the list of every goalie who played a starter's workload that finished an AHL regular season with a save percentage over 940 in the past 16 years. 2014-15, Matt Murray. End of list. And what did this he is finish Logan, with? Uh, 941. Okay. <laughs> so Logan Thompson's 943 is the best uh, save percentage to finish a season in the last 16 years. Now, yes, wow. games played and blah, but like if you watched Hendrick Silver Knights games this year, and if you're an awards yeah. voter, there's a good chance you didn't. Uh, he he earned every every penny of that 943. He was yes. unbelievable all year. Uh, this is Logan Thompson's award. Anything less is a subversion of justice. As someone who watched Logan Thompson play in person, I can confirm that this is one instance where you can look at the stat sheet and you can pick the person at the top and you are choosing correctly. This is yep. this is the one this is the one instance this season that you can do that and you are not at fault and you are not erring in your ways. But like so, I don't even know who the alternative choice is here. Like uh, I mean yeah. Uh I mean cuz you had kind of a split load there in Hershey and and those uh, yeah. Zach Fale and Phoenix Copley, but I mean who would you pick one over the other? You could nah, like, you couldn't. You, in my I, opinion. I would take Kukali, but like he only played 11 games. Right. And yeah, everyone played like no games this season, but like 11. Right. Uh Stuart Skinner won more games, but Stuart Skinner also played more games and he also is Stuart Skinner. <laughs> Like your his state percentage is, I think, 30 100. points below Thompson's, and he won more games by like three. Mm. So we will double riot if uh, <laughs> Moonshine gets that award. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's all for our awards talk. We'll, we'll come back around. And like Sean said, we have an award show of our own. We're going to get dressed up, get, you know, dressed to the nines a little bit. So we'll we'll do that here later this week. So stay tuned for that. But... We're going to be moving on in the show. Yeah. If you're just here for news and notes and don't care about the Pacific division playoffs, deep dive that we're headed to next. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from. So you get episodes in a timely fashion. You sure aren't going to want to miss uh, the uh, next episode, which is our own Calder Farmstead AHL award show as we've been pumping the tires pretty hard. I'm <laughs> really excited about it. I've been excited about it for a long time. I know CC has as well. Also, make sure you check us out on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram at The Calder Farmstead and Twitter at Calder Farmstead. If you enjoy uh, listening to us as a podcast, I feel pretty good you'll like us on social media as well. We are going to take a quick break so you can hear from some sponsors so that we can pay for my tuxedo rental for the award show. So uh, hang on. We will be right back. The final postseason series in the 2021 AHL playoffs that was only in the pacific division the henderson silver knights versus the bakersfield condors your typical one versus two seed out there in the pacific division after the play-in round seeds four through seven the semifinal with henderson and san jose the semifinal with bakersfield and san diego it all led up to this so let's start it off game one wednesday may 26th you know the last two bakersfield games that preceded this against San Diego in the semifinal. They went to overtime. So what the hell? Why not make it three in a row? <laughs> what led up to the back to back to back OT matchups for Baco? Start us off, my man. Well, first I just want to say, A, um, these playoffs are dumb and shouldn't be happening. The players don't want them. Now right. that we've said that, we've talked about that at length. We just feel like it needs repeating. Uh, this game one still definitely did not have the intensity of a playoff game, but it was at least passable as a regular season game, which is a step in the right direction from what we saw from Bakersfield and San Diego, which felt like uh, exhibition games for the most part. Um, but like we talked about in the preview a little bit, uh, we needed the Condors, if they were going to have shots at this, 
to get good shifts from the bottom six. Um, they need to kind of battle, battle those shifts to a draw at worst. They didn't need their bottom six, their bottom two lines to go out there and win the game for them. They just needed them to not objectively lose it. And right. they got that in game one. Their bottom six, they had a lot of good shifts. Uh, they had a couple good cycles in the offensive zone, generated a scoring chance uh, here and there, didn't allow any real big zone entries, dump and change, perfect shifts repeatedly from uh, that bo those bottom two lines in Bakersfield. Uh, but overall, the Condors really controlled game one uh, pretty much start to finish. They didn't generate a whole ton of offense in the like opening half of the game, but they did a really good job of keeping the Henderson Silver Knights from doing anything noteworthy early on in game one. They kind of managed the pace of the game. They didn't really push it, but they were getting the better of possession without giving Henderson much to work with. Um, and we saw that kind of start to frustrate the Silver Knights a little bit. You saw impatience by Yurko to just stop and receive the pass uh, and an unplugged controller effort uh, on defense from O'Regan, one nothing Condors. And I do have to comment on the nasty assist by Malone. He has two Silver Knights all over him, squeezes out this backhand pass on a tough angle to Cracknell, who just bangs it home from a high danger area. Another big theme from this game is Henderson's uh, power play, just getting shots from good areas, but they weren't crashing the nets. Like Moonshine is giving, it, he's the juicy rebound king. And Henderson's getting good shots on him, but he's getting a, a good first save, but he just kicks a rebound to a great area, but no one's there. Like you didn't see a lot of that kind of collapse in front, which would have benefited Henderson a lot. I think that was a mistake on their part to not kind of work more towards that on their power play. They also looked like they were forcing plays, uh, forcing shots, trying to just make, you know, a hero pass across two sticks uh, from Bakersfield to, to get a, a Royal road pass and a shot off. And Henderson or, uh, Bakersfield was doing a pretty easy job of just picking off what felt like forced passes. Like Bakersfield pressured them in game one on the penalty kill, but not to an extent where it was like, my God, they had no time. It was like Bakersfield was everywhere. That, that wasn't the case in game one. It, it looked a lot like Henderson forcing plays on the power play. Uh, but as the game went on, Condors started to tilt their ice, uh, tilt the ice and get chances in their favor. They did a good job of keeping Henderson away from anything dangerous on Stuart Skinner which uh, the same is not true for Henderson and Logan Thompson, who did everything he could to steal that game for Henderson in game one. Um, but despite that like limiting effort by uh, Bakersfield, the Knights were still dangerous. Called us with a bad turnover uh, and a, a pretty questionable pick by Ron Beard on Caldas springs Ben Jones in the breakaway to tie the game. But Bakersfield responded right away. Uh, Lavoie found a soft spot in the five tight defensive structure uh, in Henderson's zone, gets a high danger shot away. High danger shots from those like in close slot areas, uh, contrary to popular opinion, are the most likely to generate rebounds, not shots from the point, shots from the outside. It's ones that the goalie has to react to fast and doesn't have the ability to process it quickly enough to be able to direct the rebound where he wants to go. Um, and that's what happened here. Logan Thompson kicks the rebound right into a bad area. Seth Griffith gets to it first, 2-1 Condors. We have to talk about the game time goal here uh, from Dorofiev because I literally hit pause, stood up when I was watching that game. It was just like, that may be goal of the year. Sean has oh. a number of... He has a number of obscenities in the outline that I'm sure he's not going to say in regards to that goal. <laughs> yeah, like, holy bleeping bleep, what a goal that was. Like, Marashev on the spin move to Miramanov on the goal line, who no look one touches it across Royal Road to Dorofiev, who just bangs it home. Like, I think even Stuart Skinner was probably just like, yeah, that was nice. I'm not yeah. even mad. Like I'm not that even was mad, bro. real good. If you haven't seen that goal, I'm pretty sure if you go on the AHL webpage, you can find highlights of it. It's dirty. Like that is I'm trying to think of another goal I saw this season that was dirtier than that. That was just like stand up. Oh my god, that was amazing. Like filthy McNasty status. Yeah, like none really come to mind. I don't think anybody scored a Michigan this year because that's about the only thing I can put on that. Like that was – because that wasn't just one dude doing something nasty. That was a spin move, a no look across from the goal line, and a beautiful one-timer to slam it home. That's what a well-oiled machine looks like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and 
if I were uh, Manny Viveros, I'd be like, oh, those three Russians all just did what looked like a, a play they've been practicing for years. Hmm. He did not keep them together, which I was kind of surprised by because I would have seen them and been like, them, uh, next shift them, and then them again. <laughs> but <laughs> run them till the wheels fall off. Three yeah. game series. Why not? You know? And I mean, they're, they're three Russians. So maybe that's. Uh, being stereotypical but to think that they would click together but i have at least one play to show that they do mm -hmm. but after that highlight real goal the game really opened up in game one um with i thought henderson tipping the scales and chances for what felt like the first time all game that they started to break through the condors a little bit bakersfield got a good is getting good chance in this too they had a good one with cracknell that hit the post off the rush but momentum definitely felt like it was swinging uh to henderson after that dorothy of beauty uh, but they make it to overtime. Overtime was officiated via prison rules. Uh, Stanton twice uh, played defense via bear hug, the puck carrier, directly in front of the referee. No call. But a very fun overtime. Back and forth uh, both sides. But the Condors just getting more quality chances as they were way more willing to just smother guys in the defensive ends, knowing that they will not be called for it. Uh, they got good cycle pressure. Uh and they force a bad chance by Henderson. Yurko loses Cracknell in the neutral zone. Condors win at no T. Overall, though, uh, Bakersfield was the best team in this game, I thought. They, they were the team that deserved to win game one. Skinner was not asked to do much before, I'd say, about the halfway mark of the third period. But he stood tall when the Condors needed a save. And the Condors did what they've been doing all season, which is making sure when he kicks out bad rebounds that they are the first stick on it. Um, Thompson did his best to steal this game for Henderson, but the team in front of him was outplayed for like three quarters of this game. So it wasn't like I was surprised at first to see the results. I, I thought Henderson would take game one, um, especially with fans in the building, but Bakersfield was the best team out of the gate there. And, you know, something I noticed in the two series that Bakersfield played, and I'll try not to spill the beans too much for those who don't know the results of, of all the games in this Henderson-Bakersfield series, but Bakersfield, all the games that they won were close one-goal games. They were one-goal games. The, the games that they lost were multi-goal losses. So once the game got away from the Condors, they couldn't bring themselves back into it. But if they kept it close, then they, they gave themselves a chance and they ended up emerging victorious. So... With that in mind, maybe a little foreshadowing there. Hold Go on. Ahead. Oh, you got I have it. One fun fact here. Sure. Uh, all seven teams, you know, played games in this uh, dumb playoff. <laughs> one team of the seven finished with a positive goal differential throughout the, the playoff. It was Henderson. They were the only team to finish this, the playoffs with a positive goal differential. Every other team was either even or a minus, which mathematically huh. seems like it should not be possible. But here we are. But here we are. I did yeah. not know that. Bakersfield Sean... finished as a minus one goal differential in the playoffs. <laughs> wow. Well, with that in mind, let's talk game two. Henderson needed a win to stay alive in game two on Thursday, May 27th, and force an all-decisive game three, which is extremely weird to say. But here we are, 2021. What did the Silver Knights do? in the face of all of that adversity, needing two straight wins, I mean, which they've done during the regular season, but but how did they respond to it, Sean? Oh, that wasn't all the adversity they faced. Uh, Gage Quinney and Ryan Murphy, sir, not appearing in this film. Quinney oh. took shifts after getting plowed from behind in the third period of game one. Naturally, not a penalty called, you know, prison rules. Uh, and both of those are big losses for the Silver Knights. Uh, Absolutely. Gage Quinney, solid uh, top six uh, forward. Ryan Murphy, maybe the best defenseman in the league. Yeah, uh, when he's going. Anyway, he hit some rough patches, but that's a story for another time. Uh, Ryan Murphy's still a huge part of that defensive core, especially a defensive core that doesn't have a good like understudy for Ryan Murphy's skill set. Um, he's very dynamic. He, you know, is able to to lead the rush, join in the offense off the cycle, and they have other guys who are somewhat capable of that. But there's no one else on that blue line that I can kind of squint at and be like, "Oh, is that Ryan Murphy?" Like, they don't have a, a good understudy there. Um, but despite that very large roster hole to fill, um, Henderson controls the majority of this game and got Moonshine to be Moonshine. Um, the Condors, once they started getting down, got very rattled and just made bad turnovers trying to stretch the ice to, like, uh, respond quickly. 
And it ended up with them just making bad turnovers, serving up pizzas like they were a Papa John's going out of business and making fun and different mistakes on top of that. Oh. Uh, the first example was off the first goal Sakura scored. I have no idea what the Condors are doing off of that faceoff as Sakura walked right across the slot and that should not be able to happen. Now, granted, he got the benefit of a nice kind of moving pick by Cody Glass that was kind of one of those like light bumps that you know won't get called but is still very much letter of the law interference. But I think Stanton misread that play as he was very late to the spot where it seemed like he should have been defending. Uh, either way, Sakura gets moonshine moving laddery, buries at five hole. Uh, definitely a blown coverage on the second goal by Henderson. Ron Beard just wide open off the high cycle as three condors in front try and sort out who's on first and whom covers whom. Uh, two nothing Silver Knights. Gildon, you know, doesn't realize he's the only guy back and can't mess around with the puck. He needed just to get rid of it, blunders it away. Ron Beard on a breakaway from his blue line uh, ended up making it four nothing Knights. They scored the third goal off a fluky bounce thing. That's whatever um the smart move though by uh the kingslayer pulling moonshine after the first period give him some rest heading into the final game this was i believe their fourth game in five days like it's already four nothing put Rodriguez in give your the guy who's very clearly going to start for game three an additional two periods of rest um as this game is essentially over and the next one is the last game of the season I'd have liked to have seen Jay Woodcroft call his timeout in that first period, though, as his team very much needed settling. But that's, I, I feel like, splitting hairs a little bit. Um, Bakersfield did at least make some efforts to come back. They dominated what I thought were the middle period, middle minutes of the second period. But it's already four way nothing and it's halfway through the game. Like, mm -hmm. it's great that you, you know, managed to show up in this game. Um, but. Overall, like, th th not not what you you were you were late on that. Um, That's a big hole to dig out of. Yeah, they also had some very strange penalties uh, to happen at the end of the game. Uh, Ryan Stanton got a misconduct penalty for something after Safin scores, and I still to this day cannot for the life of me figure it out. He was on the bench and the like high five train going by, and the ref just blows him for a penalty, and I have no idea. Like. I listened to both broadcasts like for the couple of minutes after that he got blown for the penalty and none of them seemed to know like uh, Holty on the Condors broadcast seemed to think it was an extension of the conversation uh, that came from the fifth uh, Henderson goal where he thought Rodriguez was interfered with, but like that seemed speculative, but it was, it was bizarre. I must've watched that sequence like five times because you don't just give dudes tens for nothing, but no, uh, Stanton was not done getting penalized though. Um, he got five minutes in a game misconduct for the boarding call. Um, I didn't think it was worth a five in a game. Definitely a two minute penalty. Definitely not a, a good hit. I don't know if that rises to the level of a five in a game for me, but this felt a little bit more like the ref trying to prevent goonery and chaos at the end of the game. Uh, that's basically over. So I'm okay with that. If that was kind of the, like, let's, you know, nip this in the bud before this becomes something. Uh, overall, Henderson dominated game two early on. By the time Bakersfield looked like they were ready to, you know, take control back, it was 4 nothing with half the game gone. They basically went full twos on Roadrunners, and that's not a recipe for victory. No, no, because Tucson, as we have covered quite frequently and thoroughly on this program, very Jekyll and Hyde. That if if Bakersfield is the King Slayer, if the Colorado Eagles are the Dukes of Love, and the Tucson was definitely Jekyll and Hyde this season. So I feel like we need to come up with more of a Game of Thrones name for them, as this is the Westeros Division. It's so. true. It is the oh <laughs> Westeros Division. I see what you did there. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, let's see. I mean Jekyll and Hyde. I mean it, it could be the Hound, you know, because he kind of, you know. Had the I think this is a discussion for another day. Let's. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. Feel we'll free to, to add us on social media if you have a good idea for what uh, for what Game of Thrones character Tucson should be. But let's 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 move on. Sorry yeah. about that. Six to three victory for the Henderson Silver Knights in Game Two. Again, like I mentioned earlier, that multi goal lead. You fall down in that hole early. Bakersfield just couldn't dig themselves out to it. They burn the tape. We go 
to Saturday, May 29th at T-Mobile Arena, which I thought was a nice touch that the Silver Knights were able to secure that big, bigger venue, you know, that dinky little Orleans Arena, you know, get a little more space with the new loosened and relaxed COVID, you know, restrictions, you know, get some more fans in there. So game three, T-Mobile Arena, all three games were at T-Mobile Arena, which was which was a pretty cool thing for, for Henderson to do. There in Las Vegas, actually Paradise, Nevada, for all the marbles, insert any win or go home cliche here. How did the final AHL matchup of the 2021 season go for the Silver Knights and the Condors, the Kingslayer? Well, I think the biggest uh, factor going into the beginning of the game uh, on Henderson's side was no Quinney, no Murphy, no Paul Cotter, but Alvarez comes back to the lineup after not playing the last two. Reed Duke and Thomas Yurko also back in the lineup after missing game two. Uh, on Bakersfield side, Lenstrom out for Phil Kemp, which I remember thinking at the beginning, I'm like, I mean, okay, which turned out to be, I don't know if that was an injury-based substitution or a personnel one, but man, did that one work out for them. Um, right. This game actually had some intensity to it. It didn't quite feel like a playoff game, but there was some nastiness to it and the crowd being very into this game. Like, I I remember I watched the uh, Islanders-Penguins uh, game at, from Nassau, and I'm like, I forgot what having fans in the building actually sounded like. Right. Like that piped in fake crowd noise really does not capture the spirit of a live crowd or the the emotion, the intensity. And man, it was nice to see that back at a hockey game again, to see, you know, when a team scores, just all the fans jumping up and stuff. I, I missed that a lot. Uh, but that definitely helped add to the atmosphere. It definitely, it still fell short of what I felt like was a playoff game. Uh, in terms of intensity and atmosphere, but there was some meanness to this game, which I, I appreciated. Um, in terms of uh, kind of breaking down the game, uh, Jimmy Schultz not playing a good game in this one. I, mm. I He was a regular partner of Ryan Murphy. It looked like they paired him with Braden Paschal a little bit in this game. That did not go very well. Uh, Schultz lost his guy in coverage and gave up two quality scoring chances in the opening nine minutes. I'm not going to say that if Ryan Murphy was on the ice with him, those don't happen, but... It does. It was one of those. I, I think Ryan Murphy might be missed in this game moments very early on. Again, big story from this game and for a lot of the series. Henderson not jumping on rebound chances. Uh, Moonshine, the juicy rebound king, and Henderson again just did not look prepared to capitalize on the fact that like rebounds were gonna be there no matter where you shot it from. He's not someone who controls them well. If you just were in the right place at the right time, you had a good shot at whacking one home. Right. Uh, they had one or two good chances, so it was better than games one and two, but still I feel like they should have just been shooting and everyone swarming for a rebound, and that's not what happened. Despite that, uh, Henderson dominates the first in terms of possession and, um, and had more scoring chances, but not by much. Skinner made some saves, but not what you'd expect when you look at the box score stats or how big the shot differential was. Uh, they definitely controlled the flow of the game in the first, but it, it still felt like Bakersfield did a good job of keeping them from high danger areas for the most part. Sakura did get lost in coverage as Bakersfield looked like they were ready to, you know, exit the zone, had wingers starting to cheat out. Uh, Glass finds him down low and he just walks in right past uh, Skinner and roofs it. Like nothing you could do there if you're moonshine, but that was not a, a good defensive coverage uh, moment from Bakersfield. One nothing Henderson Silver Knights. The after that math, the aftermath of that goal is a lot of momentum for Henderson, but they either missed the net, uh, got a railroad pass broken up, or Skinner's making the save, and once again, rebound can't find a, a silver night stick. A lot of missed shots, a lot of block shots. Like Henderson is dominating possession, but they're not getting them, they're not turning that into quality scoring chances. Uh, again, Condor's playing very well in front of them in front of moonshine while allowing Henderson to kind of shoot their shot, so to speak. I do want to give credit to Kessel ring, good awareness by him to see that delayed penalty on Korzak and not uh, just try and rush in and, you know, rim the puck around the boards. He exits the offensive zone with possession and basically allows the condors to kind of reset uh, and play six on five. And that's really good hockey IQ, which is, not something I really think of when I think of Kessel Ring as a defenseman, but very good, savvy awareness from him. Um, it's a big difference uh, later in the game, too, when uh, Max Gildon high-sticks Lechizan 
And instead of having that awa- awareness and patience, Jimmy Schultz just airmails it in the neutral zone on a prayer. The Condors touch up. They don't get that six on five opportunity because Bakersfield makes the most of that six on five opportunity and scores. Uh, and momentum really shifted to Bakersfield uh, at that point. And that was a moment in which after Bakersfield scores a second quick one, which I believe was a tip goal by Stuckel, um, that lead felt inevitable by the Condors when they went up 2-1 because as soon as that first one went in on the six on five, you could just feel the 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 air just deflate out of Henderson and the crowd and everything. And that that second goal is where I feel like Vivro should have called the timeout. Um, he didn't ultimately, and I wouldn't say it cost him dearly in this game, but I, I think that would have been a good moment to use it. Um, Kemp's goal is hideous uh, that he scores. I can't tell if it hits anything on the way in based on Thompson's reaction to it. It looks like it might have, um, but that's a mystery I'll doubt I'll be able to solve with AHL TV alone. That was my one complaint from this series is the other AHL teams we saw playing in NHL arenas this year in Canada and so on. Like they had fun, you know, camera setups and replay angles and that kind of thing. And there was nowhere to be found in this broadcast at all. It was. Yeah. And, and, you know, I believe it was Elaine covering, yes, Elaine covered game one and live tweeted it. And and that was a complaint that she had as well. Uh, Elaine Shercliffe, AHL Central Division correspondent for Full Press Hockey. Uh, shameless self-plug there, of course. Um, but yeah, that was, and, and I, I kind of reasoned with her and I said, well, I mean, Henderson had their setup at the Orleans Arena. And so they couldn't piggyback off of the NHL's, you know, setup at T-Mobile Arena. That would be my guess. Like they couldn't just, you know, plug and play. Uh, so they probably just had to quick. All right, we're going to we're gonna have it at T-Mobile. Or, and I don't know if it was a rush, rush decision or not, but that's the that's my, you know, my um, hypothesis. That's my educated guess on what happened there is that they had to rush over, set it up, and that's why you didn't get as good camera angles. I mean, I guess, like, uh-huh. it seemed like everyone else plugged it in pretty quickly and were able to use, like, the multi-camera setup and, like, at least a little bit of that would have been nice, but sure. not to mention, they definitely did not have the same guy who does the camera for the Golden Knights work the camera for the Silver Knights because, <laughs> I mean, he wasn't awful, but mm-hmm. he was very noticeably not the same guy. <laughs> fair. That's fair. Um, but getting back to gameplay here, uh, Henderson's power play continued to look very uninspired, and that definitely helped sink their ship in this game. Uh, for the rest of the game... Both teams traded chances after that tying goal uh, that Korzak uh, scored that I 100% believe that Moonshine let in. Like, just naked shot from the point. He, he tried to cry afterward that, uh, I forget who the Henderson forward was, like, interfered with him that skated behind, you mm-hmm. know, winning that call. You should have stopped that puck. Um, but I, I was very surprised when the game was tied. I, I would have thought that that would have been the coach's moment to lock down, get pucks deep, and kind of reassess. But both teams were just like, but what if we tried track meet? Uh, so that was very fun. Um, Zach Hayes left Logan Thompson out to dry on the game-winning goal. But my God, what a snipe by Tyler Benson. Uh, that's a shot from a very bad angle with very little time or net to shoot at. And he beats Logan Thompson sliding into the RVH. If he'd have been a quarter of a second later on that puck, Thompson probably gets it. The last 10 minutes of this game, I have to give credit to Bakersfield here. They put on an absolute clinic in how to close games. Uh, They're making sure if anything finds its way to Moonshine, it is as low danger as possible. They got great defensive efforts from their defensemen. Stanton, uh, Gravel, Gildon, Kemp all played lockdown defense, not giving up chances, you know, tight on details, making sure their sticks are in the right place, putting pressure on guys. They also got great defensive effort from forwards too. Uh, Cracknell, Griffith, Esposito, all fantastic in the final 10 minutes. Uh, Very good and entertaining game here. Uh, But while Thompson was far and away the better goalie, Bakersfield played hands down better defense in front of Moonshine. And that was the big difference in this game. Henderson dominates possession and puts a lot of shots up, but Bakersfield kept them from the dangerous areas, kept them from making, you know, high danger scoring chances uh, happen. And to me, that's, that spelled their doom. That and a power play that just repeatedly could not get out of its own way, whether it was forcing pucks, um, not being ready for rebounds, that kind of thing. 
So Bakersfield, you could say, did a very good job of keeping Henderson from the danger zone. Yeah, up into the danger zone. Macho man C.C. Hockley making one last appearance before the AHL award show. Oh, yeah. Feel the madness. Can you dig it? Yeah. Had to bring the macho man. Had to bring Mach back. Had to do it. Had to do it. But in all seriousness, reigning in from the danger zone. Danger zone. Danger zone. <laughs> I will say that the we dubbed Bakersfield to kind of go back to the beginning of the season here. We dubbed Bakersfield the Kingslayer after they beat Henderson and after they beat San Diego when those two teams looked like it was going to be them and everyone else in the Pacific Division early on this season. They beat Henderson when they were first in the division. I believe they beat San Diego when they were first in the division. Both were undefeated at the time. Both were undefeated at the time. That's right. And so we said Bakersfield is the Kingslayer. They wear the crown. The king is dead. Long live the king. Bakersfield Condors, your 2021 Pacific Division champions. The John D. Chick Trophy, money for nothing. John D. Chick for free. Maybe not for free, but little tip. Uh, Sean came up with that. I got to give him credit where credit's due. <laughs> nice Dire Straits reference. Love it. Love it. Closing thoughts on the final series playoff, well, playoff series and final games of the 2021 AHL season. For this series, I, I think one of the other big keys to it here was Bakersfield did a good job of what San Jose did not do a good job of. They defended their blue line well. They recovered rebounds well. They made sure that if Henderson took a shot, they were the first on the puck and that they moved that puck out of the zone. Those are things that San Jose struggled with mightily. And when we talked about, you know, how Henderson just rolled them over, like they basically would shoot, get the puck back, continue the possession, shoot again, get the puck back. They walked Robbie Russo and many San Jose defensemen, you know, right into the goalie. They didn't defend their blue line well. Bakersfield did the opposite job of that, especially in games one and three. And in a lot of the stretches in the, the second game where they held that distinct advantage, those are the differences that drove it. They defended their blue line well. They recovered rebounds well. They made sure that Henderson didn't have second chance opportunities. Second, um, if you watched uh, Henderson throughout these playoffs, you had to notice Miramanov and Marashev. Uh, they were amazing for Henderson in this postseason. And not players who I would have penciled in as being, you know, the, the go-to guys for Henderson this year, but they were all over the place uh, and really made an impact on, on the outcomes of these games. I have no idea if that transfers over into next season as they kind of came out of nowhere to do it. And, you know, uh, being amazing over a handful of games is something that more or less any AHL player can do. Uh, but they definitely have momentum build it, to build off headed to next year. I think they're probably going to be in Henderson still. I'm not completely familiar with their contract status as there is no cap friendly for the AHL, give or take, which, I mean, that would be fun. But uh, Mir uh, yeah. Mirashev and Miramanov, both very big contributors to this postseason for Henderson. Curious to see how that translates to next year for them. Uh, Henderson's power play, we talked about it a bunch, didn't look really good at any point in these three games for a myriad of reasons, which I think is probably worse than if the same thing kept plaguing them. Um, at times they tried to force plays, the passes they weren't there. Other times they couldn't get a zone entry despite going to the double drop play that we kind of tried to explain earlier in the season that didn't go so hot. But they actually started using that and executed to when they executed it well it worked really well but this series they could not make that that kick out pass work um the only other real regular standing problem i saw was just not crashing the net after shot attempts Stuart skinner's going to give up bad rebounds you need to be there for those but that power play hot mess really helped bakersfield sneak out with the uh, john d chick trophy uh here i have to congratulate bakersfield though they really rebounded strong after a bad start and jay woodcroft managed that team well and by bad start, I mean bad start to the season, not to the series. Um, Jay Woodcroft managed that team through this, you know, gong show of a sprint to the finish really well. And while they hit some low points, he managed to make sure the ship never capsized and got them through rough, rough waters in a division with the deepest talent pool in the AHL. Plain and simple, that's good coaching. And while I don't think he's going to be uh, interviewing for any NHL jobs this offseason, I mean, he has one strong season of coaching on, on his resume after, 
1920 in which Bakersfield was capital B bad. So that probably drags him down a bit. Um, but I, I think he has a potential future as an NHL coach. Well, you know, coaching is a, a weird thing to try and evaluate from, you know, the, the distance that we are from some of these teams, but you can see through some of the, the small decisions and moves that he made. Uh, there are coaching shops there that are very respectable, I think, and maybe not this upcoming off season, but if he keeps this pace up and continues to show, you know, good decision-making and keeping the team uh, playing consistently, the NHL could come calling eventually after they're done recycling, say, Ken Hitchcock for the 30th time. <laughs> Yeah, maybe they'll get tired of, yeah, just retread after retread and uh, bring in some new blood as some NHL teams have started to do with their AHL coaches. I mean, it's not unprecedented. I mean, you've you've seen it in the past from AHL and IHL coaches and stuff like that. But yeah, but I did want to bring up going back to Miramanov and Mershev. I did want to bring up that. Um, let's see here. Miramanov actually signed a one year entry level contract on March 16th for the 21 22 season. So he is under contract for Vegas next year. And uh, Marishev actually signed a two year ELC that kicks in in 21 22. So you could see both of those guys playing in Henderson next season. I, I think there it's pretty go. likely that they, they, I mean, who knows what next season looks like. I don't think there'll be taxi squads. Fingers crossed, fingers <sighs> crossed, fingers crossed. Please, um, God. Yeah. Please. Do we have any horseshoes I can kiss? Like what, whatever <laughs> it means to not get taxi Habits squads. Foot. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, I think they are likely candidate. Like I would be absolutely shocked if they made the Knights out of camp, even as black aces. Like, sure. They pro they showed a lot of promise this off season, but like uh, not that much. Like let's not, <laughs> let's not get crazy here. But um, I mean, We'll see what happens, but I expect them to be in Henderson next season uh, and probably have to work their way, you know, from middle six up to the lineup. But a lot of good things, a lot of good effort in uh, a postseason, which there was a lot of reason to not put in very good efforts. Um, sure. So uh, tip of the cap to them. I hope they make it back home safely. I'm assuming that home is not Henderson for them, although I realize <laughs> that's their hashtag now and I did not hashtag, intend to make it. Uh, did you really not? Because that was really good. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. <laughs> Henderson's great. Like, don't get me wrong. Who doesn't love Vegas? But I assume two Russian guys don't actually live there full time. Mm, anyway, not. anything else you want to bring up for the good of the order? Uh, yes. I mean, definitely congratulations is in order for Jay Woodcroft and the Bakersfield Condors. I mean, again, it's a, it's a Pacific Division playoffs that a great majority of the players didn't want. I'm going to guess probably a great majority of the staff. Uh, probably didn't want it either, but uh, you go on record with that kind of thing and it's probably going to be yeah, a little yeah. bit of career so suicide. So, uh, but in spite of all of that, congratulations. They, they played through, like I said, the only two losses that they had in all the postseason were, were multi-goal losses. They kept it close in the wins, four wins, all four wins that they had in the semifinal and the final were one goal wins. So congratulations to Bakersfield for keeping it close, gutting it out and getting her done. And, and really, you know, saying Henderson, you know, yeah, you won the regular season, but we're going to win this postseason and we're going to claim the John D. Trick, Chick trophy. And so, and they did. But uh, yeah, because of Memorial Day weekend, you know, we we had plans. We are, we are people outside of the Calder Farmstead, outside of our hockey coverage and everything. So unfortunately tonight, and, and it's okay, it is perfectly fine that there is no quiz. But with that in mind and with that said, I did want to say to Sean, I know that he's got a number of things that he likes to to rant about on social media. And I say that in the most endearing way possible because opinions are a good thing to have. It does, you know, it does stimulate discussion. We'll say that. And so, Sean, as I've done in the past, I want to yield the floor to you and see if you had for our last really kind of uh, recap weekend recap episode of 2021, before we get to the award show later this week, did you have anything that, well, let me tell you what really grinds my gears. <laughs> I mean, off the top of my head, there is one that's been bothering me for a while. Um, and this is kind of a longstanding uh, thing that annoys me is so as, as anyone who's watched the show on YouTube has seen, um, I own quite a lot of hockey jerseys, like a lot, a lot of them. I think I'm over 40 at this point. Um, and one of the things that 
never really sat well with me from a minor league level. I mean, from the SPHL all the way through the AHL um, is the prices. If you buy the, the jerseys, you know, name on the back, stitched everything from those teams are more expensive in some cases than their season tickets. That's bonkers, especially in cases where you're trying to sell affordable family entertainment to, to your markets. And that is the, you know, target demographic you're looking for for ahl teams and ahl entertainment but then you're like yeah but what if the jerseys were still nhl team prices mm. what, what are we doing here like yeah i know that those jerseys do not cost you that much to make or to obtain from your your provider you really i feel like too could be cutting those prices to be a lot more reasonable especially in line with what your ticket prices and other merchandise are you are appealing to a a middle class working family and trying to be like, yes, but two hundred and twenty five dollars for a blank, you know, a screen printed jersey. Get out of here. Be better, AHL teams, with your pricing on those jerseys. I understand, yes, that's cutting directly into your profit lines, but you also have to think about who your market is for those. And nobody should be paying those prices unless they're, you know, charity auctions or something like that for something right. to just try and get a jersey for your team. That's dumb. Agreed. Can't can't argue with that at all. If you want to cater to your fan base a little bit more, maybe cut those prices a little bit. Yeah. Well, 40, 40 episodes, 12 of them season preview, 28 weekend recaps and previews. And here we are. We have an award show and that will officially wrap up the 2021 AHL season for us. Yeah. 40 episodes, Sean. How you feeling? <laughs> It's like, I mean, we say with episode number, it is beginning every year and it, or a beginning of every episode. And I just, mm -hmm. when we said 40 today, for some reason, I was just like, I, if you had to ask me, like before we started recording, what episode number this was, I would have said like 28, <laughs> 31, maybe. Yeah. It's just, I mean, we're twice a week live talking about the league for an hour plus every, every mm -hmm. time. Like it's, I'll, I'll be honest. It's been a sprint. It has been fun at times. It has been an absolute grind at times. But yeah. sitting here recording Talking Hockey with you, I wouldn't trade it for anything. This has been a lot of fun. Even, you know, for all of the work that goes behind the scenes into these episodes, all the game film watching, the notes, you know, the writing, that kind of thing. Sitting here recording and talking with you, absolutely worth all of it. So uh, 40 episodes, man. <laughs> God, how many are we going to be doing next season when we have like a full oh. runway of games? God yeah, yeah, we got to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> because yeah, this was a sprint and we knew the finish line, but man, we got to pace ourselves next year. Otherwise, yeah, we, we're gonna we're gonna burn out and it's not gonna be good. So we'll that's a discussion for another time. We're having a lot of those topics that are discussions for another time this episode. But yep. episode forty, there it is. Yep, that is it for the show. If you guys are enjoying the show, please make sure you subscribe so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Please also rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening to it from. Or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, like the video and comment what you thought of the episode. Doing so helps others find the show, and your reviews help us improve it. Uh, we'd like for you to review us five stars. Um, if you think we're maybe a three-and-a-half star podcast, I accept that. But uh, a pity star and a half is really all I'm asking for in that case. You know, if you go out to a, a restaurant and your, your server is – you know, not the greatest server you ever had, you're, you're still going to give them a, a pity 10%. I don't feel like asking for a pity star and a half on top is really going to kill you. It's not going to break the bank. No. You can also find us on social media, uh, at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at the Calder Farmstead on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, links to all of that and more can be found in our link tree, which is uh, scrolling down below. All of our podcast links, if you go all the way to the bottom, you find our social media. Uh, the link to that is linktr.ee slash the Calder Farmstead. If you like listening to us, I think you'll enjoy our social media as well. CC, where can people find you? Well, my name is CC Hockley. And before I get into where you can find me individually, I will say the Calder Farmstead is part of the Full Press Radio Network. You can find this show, many other great hockey podcasts, and many other great sports and sports entertainment podcasts. We cover a lot of bases at fullpresscoverage.com. Click on podcast, drop down menu. Brrr, there's a lot of shows to pick from. So me personally, you can find me representing Full Press Hockey on Twitter at FPC 
underscore AHL. And at my personal Twitter account at CC Hawk, that's S E E S E E H A W K. The vast majority of my tweets, of course, are about hockey, but being a multifaceted individual, you know, talk about other sports, talk about sports entertainment, WWE, AEW, music. I'm a big music fan, big classic rock fan, big Rush fan. So you can see me tweeting from there as well. And as I always like to say, if it keeps me interested, hopefully it's not going to be bullshit for you. So you can check out my writing on the Full Press Coverage Network at www.fullpresshockey.com. Sean. I'm Sean O'Brien. You can find me on Twitter at Sean O'Brien 81. That's S E A N O B R I E N 81. Uh, that is a personal Twitter account, but is still mostly hockey along with some pop culture and this and that. I'm also on Instagram at Sean O'Brien underscore 81. Uh, if you're interested in the stats work that I do uh, where, you know, the PDO of each team, uh, how we project them to finish in the standings this season. You can see all of that over time, as well as how, the model that we talk about and use players, the model that picked this uh, John D. Chick uh, playoff correctly with Bakersfield, whereas we both picked Henderson. Uh, <laughs> you can find all of that at my Tableau page at bit.ly slash data dump and chase, all lowercase, all one word. Last but not least, big thanks to Adrian Drake, who made our theme music. You can find him on social media at AD underscore dysfunction. That's AD underscore D-Y-S-F-U-N. CC Iowan, so we can make music for you too. CC, take us home. That will do it for episode number 40 of the Call to Farmstead. For Sean O'Brien, I am CC Hockley. As always, we thank you guys for tuning in. And as always, we say, keep your stick on the ice. <laughs>